that's correct. Uh, all right, so um, figured as the, the sort of first uh, microbial focus talk here, I would um, give a little bit of a broad background and perspective in sequencing microbial genomes a little bit and then focus on some issues that I've been working on. So the main, the main thing that I really want to talk about is how we deal with this accelerating pace of sequencing in the context of studies of microbial diversity. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of continuously being updated how fast or good or cheap the new sequencing systems are going to be. And for studies of microbial diversity, this has just been absolutely spectacular. And so um, what I really want to do is talk about how we can try and take advantage of this if you're interested in questions that focus heavily on microbial diversity. And I'm going to tell you about basically two aspects of trying to take advantage of the new sequencing technology. The first is to think a little more deeply about the genomes that we are sequencing of isolate organisms. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project uh, that is ongoing related to this. And then how can we um, better design methods to analyze the existing data, such as metagenomic data, in the context of this better sampling? And in particular, because I'm obsessed with it, I will focus on the use of phylogenetic methods um, to analyze uh, new data. So when I talk about phylogenetic methods, I'm going to take a sort of agnostic approach to what the structure of the tree of life or trees of life um, are. So there are many different models for what the tree of life should look like. It's constantly being updated. It's constantly being debated. The point of everything I'm going to tell you about in terms of phylogeny is that whatever the structure of the tree is, it is better to try and take into account history when you're doing comparative biology than just quantifying similarity among organisms. So trying to incorporate something about the branching structure or reticulated structure of history of species or sequences or any objects is really important. And, you know, there's no one set predefined tree. It's sort of constantly um, being updated. So the first thing I want to tell you about is this issue of better sampling. And I've, um, like with phylogeny, I've been kind of obsessed with this for a long time. And so if you look at the tree of life, let's take the ribosomal RNA tree of life, and we scan through it, um, we noticed... Uh, actually about 10 years ago now, um, as did many other people, that if you looked at, for example, the bacteria, there were 40 or so named phyla of bacteria at the time. Most of the genomes came from just three of those phyla. There were some other studies, some other genomic sequences from other uh, phyla from across the bacteria, but, but very poor sampling. The same trend was seen in archaea, and the same trend was seen in eukaryotes, and the same trend was seen in viruses. So each of these lineages were poorly sampled in terms of the available genome data from across the phylogenetic diversity of those groups. When I was uh, at Tiger, which I was at for eight years before moving to UC Davis, we got a grant from the National Science Foundation to try and fill in the bacterial tree of life. It seems so pathetic in retrospect. We got, we're going to do eight genomes. Uh, the first genomes from eight phyla of bacteria for which there were cultured species but no uh, genomes available. And then when I moved from Tiger to UC Davis, I have an adjunct deployment at the DOE Joint Genome Institute, and we've um, over the last four years now, I've been doing what we call a genomic encyclopedia of bacteria and archaea, and this project still continues. It's basically marching our way through the tree of life, selecting um, lineages for which there's a cultured organism, in particular if it's available in the DSMZ culture collection, because they've been our partners, and if that cultured lineage is novel, that is distantly related from anything else for which a genome is available, we target it for sequencing. And we've gone through this process and now done about 300 genomes selected from across the diversity of bacteria and archaea. And what I'm going to tell you about first, before talking about how to use this data, is some of the lessons that came from this project, because I think they're still relevant today in terms of this sort of general approach to phylogenetic sampling. So the first is pretty simple. That is that if we use the ribosomal RNA tree of life, 
to guide us in identifying lineages that appear to be novel, distantly related from other lineages, and then we sequence their genomes, the core of those genomes, that is sort of the housekeeping genes of those genomes, appear to be phylogenetically novel compared to other genomes as well. So the ribosome RNA data, though imperfect, is a good predictor of whether or not the core of a genome will be phylogenetically novel. Now, this doesn't mean that the ribosome RNA tree is perfect. We've seen pre prior to this project, and we've also seen since this project, that there occasionally are organisms for which the ribosome RNA tree is misleading as to what the phylogenetic position of those organisms is. So um, this is usually in relatively deep branches in the tree. And this is just one example from a study by Jonathan Badger and Naomi Ward and I when I was a tiger, um, Hyphomonas, an organism, when you sequence the genome of it, most of the genes in the genome, including even the 23S ribosome RNA, produce a different pattern than the 16S ribosome RNA. Whether that's due to lateral gene transfer or convergent evolution, we're still not sure, but you should sort of always remember that the ribosomal RNA tree is not a perfect measure of the phylogeny of every organism. But it does appear to be a good predictor of sort of the general distance an organism is from other things. So sort of the most important core part of this genomic encyclopedia project and the reason the Department of Energy was sort of interested in funding this was um, a prediction that we had made that turned out to be true that by sampling from across the diversity of life, you improve your ability to make functional predictions of other organisms, say model organisms like E. coli and other reference organisms. And the reason for this is by filling in genomic data from across the tree, you're better able to do things like build protein family um, patterns, um, link together what appear to be distantly related or unrelated families, make predictions of functions with methods such as uh, non-homology functional prediction methods, um, like based upon gene location neighborhoods. The broader diversity that you have for phylogenetic sampling across genomes adds an important component to making predictions of functions for genes in any organism. We sort of thought this would be true because people, Sean Eddy and Drosophila researchers and many others had already predicted and then shown this for eukaryotic genomes and it seemed likely that it would apply to bacterial and archaeal genomes, and it definitely seems to be the case. Um, a sort of side story is that um, if you want people to use data from the genomes that you're sequencing, we have so many genomes now that it's important to um, try and digitize biological information about the organisms that are being sequenced, and there's this effort called the Standards in Genomic Sciences that has been trying to do this with metadata about organisms. So, for example, aerobic or anaerobic, um, pathogen or non-pathogen, et cetera, with you know, 200,000 genomes or whatever we have now, uh, no one's going to go look up all the information for those organisms in PubMed. It would be really nice if everyone who sequences a genome would record that information and upload it to a database so that other people can then make use of that information, and that's what this sort of SIGS effort is about. Um, so one of the most critical things that we found uh, in analyzing these phylogenetically sampled genomes relates to protein family diversity. So one criticism of our plan for sequencing from across the tree of life is the occurrence of lateral gene transfer in particular in bacterial and archaeal genomes, which is, you know, certainly occurs and is very important for the evolution of functional diversity and for the evolution of life on the planet. But if um, we were, you know, we weren't worried that much about this, but other people were. If the rate of lateral gene transfer is incredibly high, then if you sequence an organism for which the ribosomal RNA says the organism is novel, the rest of the genes in the genome won't, po might possibly not appear to be novel. You might not find anything sort of new protein families when you sequence a phylogenetically novel organism due to the occurrence of lateral gene transfer. And we showed pretty clearly that this is not true. That is, the more distantly related organisms are from each other, the more likely they are to have different protein families between them. And we showed this in a variety of ways. I'm just going to show you one of those ways. We basically did a protein family rarefaction curve where we took genome data sets, added first one genome, then two genomes, then three genomes, and counted how many protein families we see in these genome data sets. And I don't know what happened with the 
weird abstract art in the back there. Um, but if you do this for Streptococcus agalactiae, a single species, you see that each genome you add adds new protein families, protein families on the y-axis, number of genomes on the x-axis here. This is the pan genome. So within a species, you see a reasonable amount of genetic diversity for each genome that you add. However, if you do this within a family, more distantly related organisms, the rate of recovery of protein families per genome is higher. If you do this within a phylum, the rate is even higher. And if you do it from across our genomic encyclopedia project, the rate is the highest. That is, the more distantly related organisms are, the more likely they are to have different protein families between them. Another way of thinking about this, if you're not a microbial geek, um, is that synapomorphies seem to exist. Synapomorphies are shared, derived traits. Big deal in plant and animal evolutionary studies, things like um, milk production in mammals. Um, and if lateral gene transfer is really common, you might not see shared, derived traits in a single ribosomal RNA lineage in bacteria or archaea. But in fact, we do see that. So if you want to find new protein family diversity, one important thing to do is to sequence phylogenetically novel organisms. There's lots of hidden protein families in those lineages. Another uh, thing that we analyzed for the Genomic Encyclopedia Project was whether or not this helped analyze metagenomic data, data from uncultured organisms. So, you know, the, the prior to metagenomic revolution, the main way people used DNA to study uncultured organisms was by ribosomal RNA-PCR. And then one thing that people would do, and still do, is to build evolutionary trees of the ribosome RNA sequences and place the new sequences in a phylogenetic context compared to known sequences. Works great for ribosome RNA because we have a massive database of ribosome RNA sequences. You can do the same thing for metagenomic data, but for most gene families, we don't have a good sampling of those genes from across the phylogenetic diversity of life. All of the other genes, other than ribosome RNA, are coming from genome projects. So if we want to anchor a new protein family into a phylogenetic context, having complete genome sequences from across the tree is very, very important. And so we, you know, when I worked with Craig on the Sargasso C data, we showed that phylogenetic analysis of protein families in metagenomic data can be very useful. I always focus on my favorite gene, RecA. Um, there are apparently other protein coding genes you can look at, but um, uh, we, we did look at some of them. Um, and so you can analyze these protein coding genes in metagenomic data. It can be very powerful because many of them have lower variance in copy number than ribosomal RNA across taxa, which means they make better estimates of the relative abundance of organisms from the number of sequences that you get. But if you don't have broad phylogenetic sampling of these genes, you can't do much with them. I'm just going to skip over that for a second. So um, we showed that this genomic encyclo encyclopedia project improved our ability to sort through metagenomic data and assign protein families to particular branches in the tree. But not a lot. So think about that for a second, and I'm going to come back to that in a, in a couple of minutes. Why didn't that help? Um, this genomic encyclopedia project has continued. It's still going on now. There are about 300 plus genomes that have been done or are in progress. Um, a rich sampling across the diversity of cultured organisms. There have been a few zoom in projects. There's a large scale project on cyanobacteria being done at the Joint Genome Institute, run by Cheryl Kerfeld. Um, the Joint Genome Institute, as well as um, my lab and Mark Facciati's lab, who um, is in the lab next to mine and came from ISB. Um, we are sequencing from across the diversity of halophilic archaea. Apparently some people here have heard of those organisms. Um, uh, sort of on the same principle as the GIBA, pro the Genomic Encyclopedia Project, phylogenetic sampling should help us do a lot with making use of the genomes within a clade, not just across clades. So the second part of my talk, what I want to talk about is, in essence, what didn't work with the Genomic Encyclopedia Project. So we sampled from across genetic diversity, but we didn't save the world. Um, and we didn't you know, improve every single aspect as much as we had hoped. And I think the main reason for this is that most of the methods that we use to analyze, for example, metagenomic data, or even genomic data, are not tuned towards having broad phylogenetic sampling of organisms from across the tree. And they're not tuned to 
do phylogenetic analysis of things like 100 base pair alumina reads um, in metagenomic data. So there's been a lot of effort in my lab and in many labs around the country, including um, Eric Matson. I don't know if he's here. Um, oh, hey, Eric. Uh, um, and a variety of people have been trying to improve your ability to do phylogenetic analysis of metagenomic data. And there are a bunch of sort of challenges with doing this. Um, you know, one of them is the massive amount of sequences that we have, and another is the short size of the reads. And I think we need new methods to do this. So there are a variety of methods that you can use to analyze metagenomic data. And we've played around with, in essence, all of these. And we're sort of moving towards um, a new direction. So one thing that you can do is take each sequence from the environment and treat it on its own and compare it to the reference data. And so you pull out a RecA sequence and you build a tree of that RecA compared to all the RecAs from genome data, or one ribosome RNA compared to genome data. We've built tools to do this, to help people do this in an automated manner. Um, we built one for ribosome RNA data. We built another for protein family data. And so this can help you go through metagenomic data and make sense out of individual reads. But what you really want to do with metagenomic data is compare the reads to each other as well as to a reference database. Um, so. Uh, what you know, some people are trying to figure out how to do is to take a collection of reads and analyze them all at once compared to the reference data. When um, Craig sequenced the first sort of large-scale metagenomic data that we had our hands on, um, and uh, in comparison to other data sets, we started playing around with the Sargasso C data and wanted to build trees of everything in the data. And we sort of took a cheat in that, because what you end up having is sequences of the reference genes that are full length, and then sequences from your environmental data that are fragments compared to the reference data. And rather than figuring out how to analyze the fragments perfectly well, we just sort of chopped off the sequences and took ones that were, you know, covered uh, three quarters of the reference data and ignored all the other fragments and threw away some of the sequences. And we built trees for ribosome RNA, trees for RecA, trees for other sequences, and analyze them, in essence, in context with each other. But this constraint, chopping off the sequences, was very limiting, especially as Illumina data started to come out more and more, and you got shorter and shorter reads, in essence. We would like to analyze them all compared to each other. Um, so can you make a single tree with everything, even if the fragments don't overlap with each other? Um, we've been trying to play with methods to do this. One that Tom Sharpton at UCSF developed is to divide sequences up into operational taxonomic units, even if they don't overlap with each other. It's called Philo to you. Another that we've been working on in my lab that's called PhiloSift, and people in my lab have been collaborating with Eric, and Eric has a method called pplacer, as well as probably many others that I don't know the names of, um, that try and take all of the reads and a reference tree and build a single tree with all of those reads relative to the reference tree in a variety of methods. And now you can compare thousands of reads to each other and get an idea of the total diversity of your sample in a phylogenetic context. Um, I'm not going to sort of go into all of the details of exactly how that works and exactly what you can learn, but I want to just present one next step that I think would be very useful, and we've been playing around with methods to do this, and that is to try and not just do this for all the reads in one gene family, but try and do them for many gene families at once. Because one of the problems that we have with metagenomic data is in, until you know we have 2,000 HiSeq machines cranking out data from all the samples, we're going to have low numbers of sequences for each gene that we're interested in, but broad sampling of lots of different genes from across genomes. So rather than analyzing just one gene at a time, maybe we could analyze hundreds of genes at a time, concatenate them all together into one massive mega alignment, and then place each individual gene relative to this mega alignment, and then be able to say, even if you have a Rec A from Porphyromonas and a RPOB from Porphyromonas, you might be able to put them together into one giant tree. Um, and a postdoc who we've been collaborating with in Jessica Green's lab, Stephen Kembo, who's now uh, just got a faculty position, has developed a method to do this that's a variant on the Amphora method that we developed, basically concatenating 
core housekeeping genes and building a giant phylogeny of all of them together. And this allows you to now analyze metagenomic data, even if it's not very well sampled, and ask questions about ecological diversity metrics like beta diversity and alpha diversity using all the genes at once, which is one of the great benefits that comes from metagenomic data. So just as an aside, although this was mostly for Craig and now that he's left, um, uh, it may not uh, matter as much, but I just thought I'd tell you just very briefly about one thing we found when we tried to scan through metagenomic data for um, weird sequences in a phylogenetic context, which is in the global ocean sampling data, if you build phylogenetic trees of protein family genes, you find branches that don't correspond to archaea, bacteria, or eukaryotes, or any known viral lineages. That is, new branches in the trees of these genes are present in metagenomic data. We don't know what these are. They could correspond to ancient paralogs, new viral groups, or um, possibly other branches in the tree of life, either very deep branches in the bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, or a fourth branch in the tree of life. We have no idea what these are, but there is diversity out there in every gene family that people look at that is currently sort of untracked in metagenomic data. And the best way to analyze this data is through phylogenetic analysis. Um, so uh, one other thing that we really need to do when we scan through metagenomic data is to have more reference information for gene families from across the tree of life. So we've been taking all those genomic encyclopedia genomes, comparing them all to each other, building gene families, and then asking questions about those gene families like, does this gene family appear to be a good phylogenetic marker for cyanobacteria or for proteobacteria, et cetera? And we can scan through the genomic data and ask questions about not just building markers from across all bacteria, but now we can make markers for individual clades. And when we do this, we've now found, for example, that for some clades, we can have up to 1,000 genes appear to be good phylogenetic markers for that phylum as opposed to 20 genes that we're using now. So theoretically, we can scan through metagenomic data and really nail the classification of individual groups or the binning of individual groups by analyzing thousands of gene families as opposed to single gene families. This is very important because the ultimate goal would be to predict functions for genes in a lot of the metagenomic data. And we need to build information about gene families from reference data, from complete genomes, in order to then scan through metagenomic data for those gene families. So we've built hidden Markov models for all the gene families, 200,000 gene families from across the bacteria and archaea. And we can use those hidden Markov models now to scan through metagenomic data for whether or not they're present in particular data sets. And then you can try and um, as you'll probably hear from Per Bork and some of the other people here, cluster protein family diversity and see if it correlates with a particular environmental data from your samples. Um, as I sort of hinted at before, another thing that is really helpful for analyzing metagenomic data is to zoom in on individual lineages. We are doing it for the halophilic archaea. And when you do this, you see that, again, the, it's sort of a fractal nature of the benefit of phylogenetic diversity. It's true across the bacteria and archaea, and it's true within any individual lineage. So if you zoom in on the halophilic archaea, you discover a lot of novel protein family diversity that wasn't sampled by the first you know, one genome or two genomes or four genomes, whatever, from across the clade. And that novel protein family diversity helps you do experimental studies as well as interpret um, environmental data. Whatever gene family you look at tends to be enriched when you scan across the protein family, the, the phylogenetic diversity. In order to anchor all of this environmental data, we've been building what we call reference trees, a tree of all the genomes from across the tree of life. We need to get better at doing that. We're going to have I mean, there's a project that I just heard about that is sequencing 100,000 genomes this year, bacterial genomes. I mean, how are we going to keep up with that and build reference trees for all of this data? We need fully automated methods to scan through genome data and build not just trees of individual genes, but trees of complete genomes. And try to figure out how to do this has been somewhat of a challenge. Um, Jenna Morgan and Aaron Darling in my lab have been working uh, on methods to try and combine together data from across different gene families to build a whole genome tree. There are a lot of, uh, a variety of methods to do this. 
We need all of them basically to be completely automated in order to handle the onslaught of data that's going to be coming. So the, the last thing I want to mention um, is that the, for all of these projects, we've shown, in essence, that there's a benefit from phylogenetic sampling from across the tree. But what we were doing was phylogenetically sampling cultured organisms. And that's an incredibly biased view of the genetic diversity of bacteria and archaea. So if you go through the tree of life and you count up the total branch length in the tree, there's a metric called PD, phylogenetic diversity, which is the total branch length in the tree. If you sum up the branch length for all the genomes that were sequenced before our genomic encyclopedia project, you get about 25 units. It doesn't matter what that exactly means, but 25 units. All of our genomes added a lot of phylogenetic diversity. They better have, because that's how we selected them. And then if you look at cultured organisms um, that were known at the time, you would need about 1,000 genomes from cultured organisms to capture um, half of the total PD of cultured organisms that were described at that time, bacteria and archaea. So that's easy to do. However, of the ribosome RNA sequences that came from environmental samples, you would need 10,000 genomes to capture half of that phylogenetic diversity. And that was the ribosome RNA data that was available in the Green Genes database, full-length curated sequences available four years ago. I think we're going to need hundreds of thousands of genomes to capture half of the phylogenetic diversity of bacteria and archaea. We need methods to fill in the branches without culturing organisms. There are a diversity of approaches to doing this. You probably will hear about some of them here. I assume Joe Banfield will talk about this. Craig sort of mentioned some of this. We can start to fill in data from genomes of uncultured organisms as well as cultured organisms, and that will fully sample the phylogenetic diversity across the tree of life. The JGI has, Tanya Wojcicki is running a GIBA uncultured project there that's trying to fill them in mostly by whole genome amplification from environmental samples. The last thing I want to leave you with is sequencing, you know, sequencing is just sequencing. I mean, I love analyzing sequence data, but it doesn't tell us what the functions are of all of these genes and these genomes. It helps us predict things. It doesn't help us determine things. What we need is to do experiments from across the tree of life, too. We need to fully fill in the tree with functional genomic systems biology studies, like was pioneered here for the halophilic archaea. We need to now do that for 500 branches, um, 1,000 branches in the tree. We need genetic tools for many of these lineages. We need to adapt methods so that we can fill in the functional studies from across the tree of life to complement the sequence-based studies. Um, and I think um, I will just uh, leave it there. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. And I'm just going to scoot ahead to my acknowledgment slide uh, and leave it up there. And thanks.